and <laughs> they can still practice and achieve the stages of enlightenment. So then the Buddha points out how there are some people in his teaching who learn the Dhamma not in order to realize the proper goal of the teaching, but in order to engage in arguments with others. And then the Buddha compares this to a man who goes searching for a snake and then he grabs the snake by the wrong part of the body, by the middle or by the tail, and so the snake turns around and bites his arm, bites his leg, and then the man might die or be, become seriously ill because of the snake bite. And in contrast, the Buddha says that those who properly follow the Dhamma learn the teaching in order to realize the true meaning and goal of the teaching. And so when they rightly grasp or rightly learn the Dhamma, then the Dhamma will lead to their welfare and happiness. This is like the man who needs the snake and then he goes, when he finds the snake, he knows how to grab it in the right place. He uses this forked stick to hold the snake down by the neck and then he grabs the snake by the neck, puts it in the bottle or in a leather bag and disposes of it. I told you about this monk in Sri Lanka, an elder monk who is well known for his ability to catch snakes. Even hundreds of snakes he caught in his life as the abbot of a monastery till he died at the age of 87 or so. Do you know how he died? <laughs> how? Safe <Safety. laughs> oh, <dear>. Pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to fall into the next trap. Okay, and then the Buddha next follows us up with the famous simile of the raft. Again, it's like a man who comes, he's in danger on the shore, he wants to cross a lake or a river and get to the other shore, and so there's no boat, no bridge, and so what he does is to get a number of sticks, logs, um, reeds, and he builds a raft. Now the man who understands the purpose of the raft, the, the man who doesn't understand the purpose of the raft after getting to the other shore, he takes the raft, puts it on his head, puts it on his back, and then walks around carrying the raft. But the person who knows the proper use of the raft uses it to cross the river or the lake. When he gets on the other side, he puts the, the raft aside and goes walking on his way. So this illustrates those who learn, first learn the Dhamma just in order to store up a lot of conceptual knowledge, to argue and debate with others, but don't apply the Dhamma to their own practice, for their own practice. The thing is the simile is a little defective in that usually crossing the lake or crossing the river means getting beyond samsara, reaching nibbana. But the person who re really reaches nibbana just naturally won't carry the Dhamma around as a means for just conceptual knowledge, debating, and maybe showing off his, his learning. So to, re to maybe correct the simile, I mean I don't like to be correcting the Buddha, but <laughs> the way to apply it would be the person who binds the raft and doesn't even cross the river, but still staying on this side, he thinks, what a lovely raft I've made. Then he goes carrying it around, showing it to other people. You see how skillful I am in making rafts. And then the wild animal has been chasing him, catches up to him, the tiger or the alley, crocodile, and catches him and eats him. But the wise person, is one who uses the Dhamma to get across the, the lake or river, 
uses the Dhamma to get across the river of samsara, and then he'll still make use of the Dhamma for teaching others, but he doesn't just carry the Dhamma around as a body of conceptual knowledge to debate or to show off to others. Okay, so then the last paragraph that we took last week or two weeks ago was paragraph 14, the Buddha says, when you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even the teachings. So maybe we should sort of modify this to say, you should abandon even clinging or grasping the teachings. How much more should you abandon things that are contrary to the teachings, things which are not proper Dhamma? Okay, now there are two main, we could say, two main outgrowths of basic ignorance. Two outgrowths of ignorance that keep us in bondage to the cycle of birth and death. One of these outgrowths of ignorance is craving, clinging, grasping. In this case, it could be the way the sutta begins, the craving for sensual pleasures and clinging to one's views about sensual pleasures. And then the other outgrowth of ignorance is clinging to views, especially the view of a self. And so in the Buddhist teaching, like this is the fundamental say, wrong view or mistaken, distorted view, the view of a self. So in the first part of the sutta, the Buddha deals with the craving for sensual pleasures. And now starting with paragraph 15, he's going to deal with this, these views that center around the notion of some kind of substantial, um, persistent self at the core of our being. And so he begins this section by saying that there are these six standpoints for views. And he does this by explicating the wrong views of self in terms of the five aggregates. But there's a little variation that we'll come across. Normally the five aggregates are material form or physical form, that's the substance of the body, feeling, perception, volitional formations or volitional activities, and consciousness. But here for some reason we'll see that some substitution is made for consciousness. But let's go on and see how the Buddha explains this. First he takes what is called the Asuttava Putujana. This is what's translated as the untaught ordinary person, the uninstructed person of the world, the person who doesn't have any knowledge of the Buddha's teaching, or doesn't have a proper understanding of the teaching, and doesn't, hasn't made a commitment to the practice of the teaching. So this is described as the untaught, ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones, for the enlightened persons like the Buddha, the great disciples, the arahants, and so on, who is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma. He's unskilled in that he doesn't really have a clear knowledge or insight into the Dhamma, and undisciplined in that he hasn't undertaken the practice of the Dhamma. So somebody could be like a very learned, knowledgeable, erudite Buddha scholar even. So read many Buddhist texts, maybe write articles and books on Buddhism. <laughs> but you can still say, unskilled and undisciplined in the Dhamma. If one doesn't have a clear view of the teaching and 
isn't engaged in the proper practice. And somebody could be a very simple person, maybe who just knows maybe one text like Dhammapada or a few suttas. But if that person can clearly grasp the point of the teaching and takes up the practice, we could say that this person is skilled and disciplined in the Dhamma. Okay, so this person regards material form, the body, thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. So he takes the body to be mine, to be what I am, to be myself. And according to the way the commentary explains this phrase, to take the body as being mine, this shows, you would say, the work or the activity, the operation of craving. Because it's through craving that we grasp things as being mine. Sort of the function of craving is to keep on you know, expanding the range of our possessions, our acquisitions. So, I like this microphone, even though I don't have any use for it when I'm in my room, but I think this is mine. Somebody has a nice pen, I don't have it, I think I want that to be mine. Okay, then the idea, this I am, I mean, sometimes that seems to be a kind of view also, but the commentary, maybe for the sake of neatness, says that this is the function of, we call this conceit. It's the, the basic conceit is the idea, I am. And then when that conceit arises, we grasp this idea, I am, we start comparing, how do I rate in relation to others? What is my ranking? You know, in the class we have a list of students. How are they ranking? Are they top of the class, middle of the class, bottom of the class? So how am I doing in relation to others? Like, maybe I have such an income level, so <laughs> I'm upper class, so I go around very smug, self-satisfied, dressed and is Brooks Brothers still selling suits? <laughs> you know, I haven't heard this since, you know, since I was in college. So, Brooks, is it considered a high quality suit still? Like, so dress up, dress up in Brooks Brothers suits, have a Rolex watch, is it? And whenever I have to fly someplace, I always get first-class ticket. <laughs> so that's the sense superiority. If I have just the middle level conceit, just satisfied to be part of a crowd, then you know, I can just dress casually, get a cheap, ordinary watch, travel, um, economy class. You're traveling business class or economy class? <laughs> <laughs> Next time we have to get to you a first class ticket. <laughs> um, Yep, so then we just have the middle level conceit. And if we have the, you know, I'm just dressed shabbily and um, don't even travel by plane, but I have to take the train or the bus, and I don't even have a watch, but I always have to be looking in shops to find out what the time is. <laughs> That's the kind of, we call the low or inferiority conceit. So, this I am, just a poor guy, no real special credentials, nothing special. 
Okay, then this is myself. This is taken to be the work of speculative views, where one is actually framing a kind of theoretical construct about the self. So some people do this in regard to bodily form. That becomes the focus of their attention. So maybe these are the people who are, you know, the women are very concerned with their makeup, their figure, their diet, how the men are looking at them, and the men are the ones who are working out, lifting weights, going to the gym, keeping trim, keeping fit, keeping in shape. Maybe if the hair gets gray, they put on the blackener, the dye. Okay, so that's from bodily identification. Then some people fixate on feelings. They take feeling, this is mine, again craving, this I am, this is myself. Maybe this is the kind of aesthetic person who is, or maybe the hedonist, the person who delights in pleasure. Then there comes a person who fixates on perception. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. Maybe this will be the aesthetic person, the person who maybe delights in beautiful scenery, in works of art, the painter, the musician, or it could even be the thinker, the one who f fabricates systems of ideas. Then come what are here called formations. This is in Pali, the word is samkara, which really means it's based on the root, the verbal root, karoti, or the root is actually kar, to do or to make. So you get samkara. It's based on a word which means to make, to do, or to act. And so the sankharas are those factors of mind responsible for action or activity. Especially the early suttas, the suttas point out intention or volition as the main factor among the sankharas. And so now I translate the word as volitional activities. I think it's more meaningful, more accurate than on formations. Okay, so this would be perhaps the object of fixation of, we call this the person of action, maybe business executive, military people, um, person who establishes a company, wants to build up his company, the statesman, politician, the person who's always concerned with doing things. Okay, then comes, you, normally, as I said, the fifth aggregate is consciousness, vinyana, the basic, the way I understand Vinyana, that it's the basic awareness that arises based on one of the five or six sense faculties, sense bases, which illuminates, lights up the particular objective domain that's accessible to that sense base, to that sense faculty.
But in this sutta, for some reason, it's not so fully clear to me. why this is done. But instead of you showing the aggregate of consciousness directly and explicitly, the aggregate of consciousness is shown indirectly by way of its objects. So he says, he regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered, thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And according to the commentary, what is seen is the visible object, and that is supposed to be pointing to eye consciousness, visual consciousness. What is heard is, of course, sound, and that is pointing to ear consciousness. What is sensed refers to the other three sense, physical sense objects, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations. And so that term points to nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, and bodily consciousness. And then what is cognized, encountered, sought, and mentally pondered, that points to the mind consciousness, or the reflective consciousness, ideational consciousness, the consciousness that works not with external objects, but with the inner objects of the mind. And just this morning I was wondering, is this substitution of for the aggregate of consciousness peculiar to the Pali version, or is it preserved in other versions of the Sutta? So I checked the, Chi the ancient Chinese translation, and it also is the same as this. So it must go back to a very old period. But the reason for this is not very clear, but this is the way the text has come down. Maybe one of you will have some ideas about this. Okay, now the sixth standpoint for views is a view itself. And this is the full-fledged, full-blown eternalist view. It's the view of an eternal self. And so this is expressed in this way. That which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too, he regards thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Seems, I have to say, it seems strange to me that he would regard a view as being myself would seem to me sufficient simply to say that this view is the standpoint for views. But anyway, what is this view? It seems to be a form in which the dominant view and the Upanishads had come down or been transmitted to East India where the Buddha was teaching. The Upanishads must have originated in Western India northwest India, which was the center, the stronger center of the Vedic civilization. And then that view of the Upanishads would have been sort of transmitted over time and reached East India in this form, which is not really exactly the way it comes in the Upanishads. But here, what is taken to be the real essence of the self is identified with the world and that it's held that after death, but it shouldn't be after the death of any person, but it should be after the death of the enlightened person, that self of his remains permanently, everlasting, eternally, in its own essence, without ever undergoing birth and death again. OK, 
Okay, so these are the six standpoints for views in the way they are held to by the uninstructed worldly person or the untaught ordinary person. Then, uh, then the Buddha, in paragraph 16, he gives the contrary of this. This is the way the instructed noble disciple relates to the five aggregates and to this view. So the well-taught noble disciple who is regarded for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma and so on, regards material form thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. So this is a way, we say, this is a way of contemplation. It's not just an idea, not just a theory, but it's a lens. Maybe that's a good expression. It's a lens through which the noble disciple regards or contemplates the five aggregates using this viewpoint that this is not mine. So when you contemplate the body, not mine, this releases that clinging to the body. So when the body grows old, falls sick, even when death approaches, because one is not clinging to the body as mine, one is able to let go and to pass on peacefully. When views the body, this I am not, I am not the body. The body is not myself. So just as this cup, of course if I take the cup to be mine and it breaks, then I get angry or sad. But normally if I have this cup, if it drops to the ground and breaks, then I just think, okay, well if it's a beautiful cup like this, I don't think okay. <laughs> but suppose it's just a plain, ordinary cup. <laughs> then if it falls and breaks, then I think, Okay, that's the nature of the cup, is to break. And so with the body, when it deteriorates and breaks up, I'm able to let it go. Similarly, with feeling, not mine, not I, not myself. Perception, not mine, not I, not myself. Volitional activities, not mine, not I, not myself. And then the aggregate of consciousness, explained as what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized. Not mine, not I, not myself. So it uses this three-pronged um, formula as a way of examining the five aggregates. And so with all of them, one detaches from them. So that one could observe them almost objectively. And even that which is doing the observation, also one subjects to the same type of lens. Even that mind, that consciousness, which is observing the other aggregates, that also is just part of the five aggregates, which is also not mine. Not I, not myself. And so in this way, one is able, by using this formula of non-self, one is able to let go of these things that constitute our being, our empirical, personal identity. So if you're caught speeding by the on the highway, the policeman says, pull over to the side. And he says, what is your identity? He says, well, my teacher told me <laughs> that, I, that, I, that myself. Okay, so those are the five. And then comes the way it's expressed here, the standpoint for views. This too, he regards, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. What would be more meaningful or more sensible to me would be to simply say, 
he does not take up that standpoint for views that which is the self is the world after death I shall be permanent everlasting just like and shall endure as long as eternity okay maybe at this point I'll ask whether there's any questions on what we've covered so far before we go on I mean, do we have the floating microphone? Okay. In, in the list, um, I think it's not on there. What is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, and encountered and sought. Yeah. I'm wondering about encountered and sought because sought looks to me like it should fit under volitional formation. Hmm. And encountered yeah. looks to me like it should fit under material form. Hmm. So I'm wondering why are those two thrown in there? <laughs> Good question. But it's we always come across those words as part of a fixed formula in different contexts. So quite possibly this was a formula in circulation during the Buddha's time, which the Buddha is just picking up and using. Not something that he's uh, himself formula <coughs> formulated as something original, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I don't really have an explanation for it. Yeah, I would just say you could see the word. You could see the word sought there. As yeah. he's, he's talking about that which is sought. He doesn't. He's not referring to the seeking. So the volition which is sought. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Um, so he's referring to the objects of doesn't seeking. One isn't seeking something a volitional activity? But this isn't talking about seeking. He's talking about that which is sought, the object of seeking. So we could also say the object of seeking isn't consciousness. <laughs> but stands a, in for consciousness, that's the way. But stands in for consciousness. Yeah, it's a little, I have to say, it's a little strange and I don't fully understand the use of that formula there instead of the aggregate of consciousness, what the reason is. Perhaps, do you have some idea about that? I do, actually. Yeah. Uh, he could be splitting up consciousness like that in order to emphasize to Arita and the rest of the bhikkhus that the opinions and views that form when you ponder the Dhamma must also, must be, that's what must be let go of, because Arita has developed this idea. Yeah, that could be a good idea. This, this opinion of his. But those are like, his views are based on what is seen, heard, sensed, and kind of, so. Okay, let me take some internet questions. Okay, what is the difference between perception and thought? Okay, now thought is not explicitly mentioned within the, the five aggregates, but let us say that the function of perception is to select qualities of the object, to focus in on qualities of the object, and then to form, say, basic ideas, concepts, and notions about the object. And then what we, we call thought, which in Pali would be the two mental factors, vitaka and vichara, is the way we turn the object over in the mind and bring up original ideas about the object and connect our perceptions into a network or system of ideas. So thought is a more sophisticated, more complex activity which builds up on the foundation of perception. Perception is more rudimentary, whereas thought is more complex, more cognitively sophisticated. Okay, then. Is the delusion, this is myself, 
mainly about the desire for total control, the control freakish nature of conceit. I don't think the idea of this is myself is necessarily about the desire for total control. It's the way I see it, it's more expressed more the desire to find some kind of basis for one's sense of personal identity. Okay, third question. Are the sankharas here translated as volitions? rather than formations, also about past conditioning habits and the tendency to make choices and thought, speech, and action. Yeah, I would say sankharas partly are past conditioning habits and tendencies, but also it's the present activities, the choices themselves and the way we express our choices in bodily action, speech, and thought. The fourth question is consciousness described in the Nikayas as having two aspects. One, the dynamic doer with the tendency to the outflows, the asava. And second aspect, the static knower. I would say normally consciousness is aligned more with the knowing and the awareness and the doing. Of course the mind functions as a whole with many constituents, but the doing is more the function of the sankharas. But of course this takes place within the field of consciousness, since when we act or do something normally we know we're aware of what we're doing. Take the floating microphone. Uh, is, is um, mindfulness yep. uh, an aspect of, of consciousness? An aspect of consciousness. You see, within the early texts, there are many other mental factors which are not specifically assigned to the framework of the five aggregates. But later, say in the period of the Abhidhamma, then attempts are made to fit all the mental factors into the five aggregates. So what happens is that the fourth aggregate, the aggregate of volitional activities, is treated as a kind of umbrella category. So all of the other mental factors, except feeling, perception, and consciousness, are put into the sankharas. And so mindfulness, the wholesome factors, like mindfulness, loving kindness, generosity, um, wisdom, go into the sankhara aggregate, and also the unwholesome mental factors like greed, hatred, ignorance, worry, envy, jealousy, conceit, all of those go into, again, into the aggregate of volitional activities. Okay, unless there's any urgent question, we should go on. Okay, now, coming back to page 230, paragraph 17, the Buddha says about the noble disciple, the instructed disciple, since he regards these things thus, he is not agitated about what is non-existent. And the text here uses an important word, significant word, which seems to have two connotations in the discourses.
This is a little complicated to explain. <laughs> okay. The verb that comes, that's translated, is agitated, is paritasate. And this seems to be related. Excuse me. You see, pari is a prefix. And then the root of this in Sanskrit is trish. And so the Sanskrit form of the ver verb would be pari trishite. And from this you could say that it's closely related to the noun trishna, which means that's the Sanskrit for craving, which in Pali becomes tanha. And so one sense of the word paritasati, probably the older, more original sense, is to crave. So it's simply the verb that goes with the noun tanha, craving. But there's another verb in Pali, tasati, which means to be afraid. And so somehow the verb paritasati got mixed together with the verb tasati, which means to be afraid. And so the verb paritasati came to take on two meanings. One is the older meaning of to crave, and then another meaning, which is to be afraid, or to be anxious, to be fearful. And so, when I was working on this, I was trying to find, I don't remember what word Venerable Nyanamoli used for this, but I was trying to find one word that can cover both aspects, craving and fear. And so, I settled on agitation, to be agitated. Okay, so, here the Buddha says he is not agitated about what is non-existent. And by what is non-existent, the Buddha seems to be referring to this eternal self or permanent self. Okay, now when the Buddha says this, then one monk asks the Buddha, can there be agitation? Because that craving and anxiety or fear about what is non-existent externally. And the Buddha says that there can be, and he gives the example of someone who thinks of something that he had. Alas, I had it, but I have it no more. There's something one possessed, but now one has it no more. Like everyone loses one's job, Things before I had the job, now I don't have it. People lose them. nowadays losing their homes. I used to have it, I have it no more. So this kind of sorrow comes up and grief. And then also we have yearnings and longings for things that we fail to get. So one thinks, alas, may I get it, may I have it, but I don't get it. And so when one thinks in this way, then the text says one sorrows, grieves and laments, one weeps, beating the breast, and one becomes distraught. One gets into a state of bewilderment and confusion. So that is how there can be agitation about what is non-existent externally. What one had and lost, and what one wants but doesn't get. Then the monk asks, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? And then the Buddha just takes basically the same example, but in the case of somebody who doesn't think in this way. So this is somebody who just accepts whatever he obtains and doesn't yearn and long for what he doesn't obtain. So in that case, this person doesn't sorrow, grieve, weep, and so forth. Okay, then the monk asks, can there be agitation about what is non-existent internally? Okay, this is the more interesting case. 
So the Buddha says there can be, and he says here, somebody has the view, that is the view of the permanent self, that, that which is the self is the world, after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal. Then he hears the Buddha, the Tathagata, or the Buddha's disciple, teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints for the view of self, the elimination of all decisions, it's not such a good word maybe, for all, let's say, commitments to the view of self, all obsessions with the idea of self, all adherences to a view of self, all underlying tendencies to the ideas of I, mine, and myself, for the stilling of all conditioned formations, for relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, 